accidental fellow because I actually had no intention of ever becoming a safe fellow. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, it means that I've been out in the field uh, for the past half decade working with enterprises on implementing the Scaled Agile framework. So the first, uh, I want to say, um, year was uh, completely in uh, with clients dealing with um, applying the framework, uh, dealing with some of the challenges and cultural challenges they had in, in implementing uh, Scaled Agile at the, enterprise, at the enterprise level. So I was actually sucked into this from Dean Leffingwell, who I've worked with for uh, over the past 20 years, started at Rational Software with him, and that, again, that was another accidental uh, position because we got acquired by Rational Software when I was doing, when I was the product manager for Requisite Pro. Who's ever worked with that tool? Requisite Pro, anybody? Yeah, they're like, <laughs> yeah, kind of, I worked with that tool. Um, so since then, he's always been a mentor and a, and a leader in my mind and someone that I could learn from. So when we exited our journey from Rational and they got bought by IBM, we kind of both went our separate ways. I went back into my passion, which was software development, started my own little development firm, and uh, Dean went his own way as well. We came, we came back together uh, building a bunch of different startups and learning from the different startups along the way. And eventually I landed in a, in a very fun position, kind of being a senior product owner for uh, an energy management company that was building some highly complex solutions for, for energy management, putting real smart devices in the home when the smart grid wasn't even built yet. So you can imagine some of the challenges that we had there. And Dean called me up and he said, uh, so uh, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm, I'm doing this really cool thing um, at, 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 my, at my company. He said, well, um, so I'm going to write a book. And I know you've been applying some of these best practices at scale. You know, would you be willing to, to, to help me with the book and, and donate some, some time to this book? And I said, sure, what's in it for me? And he said, you get to be in the book. <laughs> How many people have written books? Kind of a, yeah, one of those things where um, only rewarding when the book actually comes out and you get some visibility in there as well. So he, we wrote this book and it came out and it was called Agile Software Requirements and it was about Dean's third book. And, and you open up the front cover of this book. Who's read Agile Software Requirements? Yes! So you open up the front cover and what'd you see? The first rendition of the big picture. So uh, I was teasing him at, at the coming out party for the book, and I said, well, this is, this is your next thing. You know, this is going to be your next business. And, he, and you know what he said? He said, no, it's not. And I said, well, why not? And he said, because I never want somebody working for me ever again. <laughs> for the love of people, right? So a uh, couple years later, uh, he called me up, and he said, well, I hate to say this, but you were right. Um, it's a thing. I put it out there for free, and people are actually adopting it. I put the framework out there on scaledagileframework.com, and people are actually using it. So, Jennifer, would you come run the company? And I said, no, I'm not going to come run the company. And he said, well, why not? And I said, because I'm a practitioner. I love doing the work. Why would I want to run the company? I don't want to be in the company. I want to be in the organizations doing the work. So. He, kind of shook his head and in disappointment walked away, found somebody else to run the business. About six months later, he called me up and he said, well, n n now I need people actually doing the work. <laughs> you won't be working for me, but I actually need people doing the work. So I was still working for uh, this energy management company. He said, well, do, do you have any vacation? <coughs> do, would, you, would you have time to go help this company uh, do this, this enterprise-wide transformation? And I said, Sure, I, yeah, I actually do have some vacation, and I'd love to learn. I'd love the opportunity to see how other people do this. So I was a little naive going into this. Um, yeah, they basically had about a week to prepare, and had some courseware, and kind of knew what was going on. And they flew me out to Philly. Steve was there. Steve Adolph was there. And uh, walked into the room on Monday morning, and what I noticed was there was all kinds of Cisco audiovisual happening, and, and at about quarter to eight, there were literally dozens of people piling into this room. And I turned to my colleague, who I was pairing with, Drew, Drew Gemelo, one of the founders of, of Scaled Agile, and I said, so how many people are actually coming to this thing? And he said, well, we're going to have about 100 people here. And then we've got about 50 people in India. And then we've got another couple dozen people in London. So I promptly went to the bathroom and threw up. And then <laughs> came back out. And, uh, 
throughout the week, we actually trained up uh, hundreds of people <coughs> on uh, dealing with Scrum at scale. So say Scrum XP, dealing with um, using XP best practices and Scrum and Kanban and how we organize around value. And then we, we went into a two-day remote face-to-face -face planning. I've never seen anything like it. So at the end of the week, uh, I said, I'm, I'm on board. I, I want to do this. So it was number three of joining Scale Agile, uh, and that was about three years ago. And since then, uh, we, we just ran the numbers. We just ran a partner summit where we actually had 77 worldwide partners uh, come to our summit. We're a very lean organization. We are literally only 25 people. And the reason that this has become so prolific is because we put it out there for free. And people have started using it. And people have started adopting it. So our model has always been to be an intellectual property company. To take the knowledge that we're gaining from people like you, who are doing uh, agility at scale, and bringing that back into the framework. So that said, uh, after running the numbers for this summit, we've uh, we looked into our database and we have over 35,000 safe practitioners worldwide. Uh, those represent about 60% uh, of the uh, Fortune 500 domestically and about 10% of the Global 100 around the world. So pretty phenomenal for only three years of work. Now that said, uh, we're on Scaled Agile Framework version 3.0 it's going to continue to evolve. Um, we're uh, readily working on 4.0 at home. We don't necessarily have an exact date in which we're going to ship that. We're going to ship that when we're ready <laughs> so that you're actually ready to consume that. But I am going to give you a little preview at the end of that. So all that is a backdrop for, for this talk, the nine immutable principles of, of lean agile development. So when we go into an organization, uh, the first thing we do is we say, well, where are your leaders? Let's get your leaders trained up on the framework. Why do you think that is? So I, when I do these talks, I, I never like it to be a one-way conversation. I always like to you know, have a dialogue. Adoption. Right? Adoption, absolutely. And support. Yeah, having that sufficient coalition for change. It's much easier to go in there and train the leaders on a new way of thinking of perhaps bringing in new habits to the organization and being that foundation for change. So that said, we look at the management challenge and Deming's, you know, one of the leaders out there in, in management, you know, he says, it's not enough that management commit themselves to quality and productivity. I want quality and I want productivity. They need to know what they need to do in order to get there. So such a responsibility can't be delegated. We look at Agile, and we look at, well, we, we decentralize control. We let, we let the people do the work. We don't have managers on the teams. Well, management plays a huge role in, in scaling agility. So some of the foundations are, are the values, and the values in which we all embrace uh, going forward from a, from a framework perspective. And, and we're all familiar with the House of Lean. Um, basically, you know, a, 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 a paradigm for, for lean thinking. This has evolved over time as well. Uh, who, was, who has been implementing uh, Scaled Agile Framework version 2.5 or even 3.0? Who out there? Steve. Are there any other SPCs in the room? Raise your hand. Does anybody know what an SPC is? <laughs> oh, they went to Mark's talk. Excellent. So SPCs are safe program consultants. Uh, and these are the folks that we train so that they can go in and train the organizations on, on how to do uh, lean agile at scale. So previous rendition of this of the of the House of Lean had three columns, and over the past year as we evolved the framework, uh, we added uh, a, a, a fourth column. And what is that? We've already talked a lot about it. What's that? It's actually innovation. Innovation is part of the values in which we embrace, allowing time for our people to actually innovate. Because we talked about when does the customer actually know what they want? When we show them something they don't want. 
So let's bake it in to the, into the House of Lean. And we've evolved some of the, the pillars as well. It used to be respect for people. And now we've evolved that to respect for people and culture. Uh, it used to be continuous improvement. But continuous sounds so nice, right? So we do this nice thing. Well, it, we've, we've evolved that to relentless, constantly looking back and evolving our learnings from what we've done in the past. So the purpose, obviously, is value, organizing around value. It's really easy when you're a small organization to, to align your people around the purpose and, and the value and then the customers, uh, the end game, the customers. But when you're dealing at enterprise scale, it's, it, it can become difficult to organize the enterprise around the value in which you're, you're delivering. And sometimes it's multiple levels of value. So we still want to be able to achieve that sustainably shortest lead time and get the value to the customers as fast as we possibly can. But when we're dealing with enterprise, can that be difficult? Why do you think that is? Too many moving parts. Too many moving parts. We've created silos along the way. We've optimized for maybe not the right thing. Maybe we've optimized for marketing. We've optimized for development. We've optimized for, for, for accounting. But that doesn't help the customer. That doesn't help get the value out to the customer. So I love the Sam Walton quote, you know, there's only one boss and that's the customer and he can fire you. So when we talked, I'm gonna talk mostly to this pillar, uh, respect for people and culture. Uh, because it is the people that actually do all the work. And this is where I have a lot of compassion and empathy for. Um, uh, the, 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 your customer is whoever consumes that work. So when your development team and you have product management actually asking you to do the work, who's the consumer of that work? <coughs> Okay, so there, there's a handful of you. How many concurrent projects do you load onto the system at any given time? Just any number. 30. 30. What else? How many? All of them. All of them. Absolutely. <laughs> One large financial organization I went to, multi-billion multi dollar organization, I went in and I started looking at their portfolio. The first question I, I asked was, you know, how many, how many things are you actually loading on to this, to this system, this, uh, this organization? And they said, well, we have 98 concurrent projects going on at the same time. But how's that going? Not very well. That's why you're here. So don't overload them. Don't make them wait. Don't make them do wasteful work. From a development standpoint, what is wasteful work? Meetings, okay, I like that one. <laughs> Things that don't add value, absolutely. So making sure that we're, we're constantly aligned around the highest economic uh, uh, value that we can actually deliver at the right time to our market. So build long-term partnerships based on trust. One of the values of the framework is transparency because it actually builds trust. Imagine if you had an organization where you, you actually knew what the epics were that were coming down the pipe from the portfolio. You actually had a visibility into that Kanban system at the portfolio level, and you actually had visibility into what was happening at the program level from a, from a backlog perspective. And when we talk about culture, uh, wouldn't it be great if culture came first? Wouldn't that be great? But the bottom line is culture comes last. And in order to change the culture, you actually have to change the organization. So we value the Agile Manifesto. This is one of the, the things that we train the organization on. As a leader, we, we go through the manifesto. We talk about it. We talk about every single value and every single principle behind it. And we use this as a thinking tool. And we say, yeah, this has been out there since 2001. This is good food. You should use it, and you need to know it. So embrace these values and use them as a thinking tool when you're working through uh, the highest economic value that you can actually deliver going forward. So let's take a look at these principles. This is actually new 
to the framework. Uh, this happened last week when I was training up about, I don't know, 110 people. And, and I was like, are there any engineers in the room? Can somebody just like help me put this thing back up? Well, thank you. <laughs> Um, so, when we were looking at evolving the framework, it became highly obvious that, uh, well, uh, the, the challenges that the enterprises have are absolutely unique to the enterprise. When we're looking at lean and agile at scale, the principles that underline some of the best practices that we have are somewhat universal. So, we took some time uh, and, and pulled these together, and we, did, we actually did a huge thought experiment this year where we took the framework and we branched it. Ooh, we branched the framework. And uh, we branched it into a, a, another derivative called uh, Safe for Lean Systems Engineering, because we're like, oh, well, you know, big people are doing big things. Let's, look at, let's take a systems view, and, and, let's, uh, and, let's, and let's branch it and, and see how this applies from, from, from a systems thinking perspective. And what we realized, the first uh, class that we actually taught in lead systems engineering was that you guys, the customers, said, we don't want two frameworks, we want one. So we brought all that information, you know, after we rubbed our wounds, we, we brought all that information back and we said, well, then, then, then the principles behind them should be the same as well. So while they may be different for sure, the principles will also help improve the quality of the product and service uh, in, in nature, or universal in nature as well, another Debbie's quote. So here they are. Uh, is anybody familiar with Alex Yakima? He's one of those agile babies. Uh, I had the privilege of working with him about 10 years ago. He, he came over from the Ukraine. Uh, well, he was in Ukraine at the time we were dealing, we were, we were working on a, a program where uh, engineering was in, Boulder, Colorado, uh, product management was in San Diego, and the entire development team was in uh, the Ukraine. So I'd fly over there uh, every, every five weeks or so to go through kind of the final, final phase before we, we would release. We were a, a, web, a web shop. And, uh, and he's actually one of those uh, people that was born and raised uh, in Agile. <laughs> And he can't even think in another way. So it's, it's pretty interesting. Anyway, he, he would call this the Russian doll. Um, I call it the ornament. So here we go. Let's dive into each and every one of them. So number one, take an economic view. Uh, so when we're dealing uh, with uh, de de delivering value at any and at any time, we always want to deliver the thing that has the highest value at the right time. But how do we do that? And how do we have those objective conversations around what it is that we need to deliver next? Well, let's build an economic framework and think about all the different things that might go into this economic framework. So obviously, there's always going to be risk. We're always going to have cycle time, how long it takes to actually build something. We're always going to have cost. Developers cost money. <laughs> and that's what we fund. There's always going to be some sort of value in there as well. So. Uh, what are some of the other things that you might use in your economic framework? I've got one in mind as well. What are some of the other factors that you might use to make decisions around what you might sequence next in the backlog? What, what can we not do that's still going to bring us up? Absolutely. What can we not do? What can we perhaps defer going forward? What else? Clarities from the business? Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's think of some of the different uh, domains that we work in. I had, had the benefit of going into a large aerospace company, and they were actually building uh, the next generation of a, of a Navy uh, uh, B-9 bomber. And um, I got to sit with the development team for quite a while, and we were building their economic framework. And one of the things that they put in there was fuel. We can't fly something without understanding the consumption, the load, um, you know, all the different algorithms that go around fuel. So this actually was part of their economic framework and their, and, their, and their basis for making decisions on how they should sequence their backlog. But if you only quantify one thing, quantify the cost of delay, what's it going to cost for us not to do this thing? Are we going to miss Christmas? 
are we going to get, have a regulatory penalty if we don't do this thing? In the, how, many, how many people in the financial industry out here? Yeah, so there's, there's these other factors that go into this as well. So understanding, so Reinerton, Don Reinerton, who's read the book, tell me about this thing, right? Has anybody read it? Yes, read, read it three times, kind of the science behind product uh, development flow. So understanding the economics requires the understanding of the interaction between all these multiple variables. So I've applied uh, economic frameworks within, within large organizations using, using a tool that we call weighted shortest job first, another, another Reinerson construct. And uh, amazing things happen. It creates a nice objective framework around having healthy discussions on what we should sequence next in the backlog. Seeing multiple different business units come together and have these healthy conversations around what we should put next in the framework or in, or in, the, or in, the, um, in the backlog. So, so we talk about uh, sequencing for economics, but sometimes economics and, and value, it's not only about making money. Um, I'm gonna turn this conversation a little bit to uh, something that's kind of near and dear to my heart. And, um, a few years ago, a friend of mine uh, asked me, she said, will you pair with me? I, I, she's not an engineer, but she said, will you pair with me? I actually want to run a 100 mile uh, race, this ultra, this ultra race. Do you guys do this here in Vancouver? Run these crazy races. So I'm 54 years old, I really didn't want to do it. But I said, okay, um, I'll help you with it. I won't run the race with you, but I will train with you. I will um, go with you to the race and I will, su I will support you all, all the step of the way. So we spent about nine months training together. And it was everything from you know, our runs to our food to our sleep. I mean, everything was, was uh, part of this uh, goal that we had of getting her across that 100 mile line. So uh, some tragedy ha happened along the way. We actually got to the point where it was her race and uh, who was familiar with the floods in Boulder two years ago? Her race was on the day that the entire city of Boulder and Lyons was underneath many feet of water, including my house. So I couldn't go. Uh, but I had some friends go and support her, and uh, she finished the race um, in just under 25 hours, which is amazing to uh, finish a 100-mile race in, in just under 25 um, hours. So she came back, and she said, oh, my back's kind of hurting. And I said, well, you just ran 100 miles. <laughs> you know, I, of course your back is going to be hurting. And this was persisting over the next uh, few months, and then finally I said, well, you, you kind of need to go get this, this checked out, go to the doctor. So she did, and um, the prognosis was she had eight weeks to live. She had pancreatic cancer. So at that moment, I made a huge economic decision, and I said, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm going to stop doing this, and I'm going to take care of uh, my best friend. I'm going to see her through the end of her life. So we make choices based on what is most economically important for us. And for me, the importance of life uh, meant more than anything else. And this theme has been persisting throughout the framework. She, she died nine weeks later. Uh, I was with her to the end. But this theme of uh, helping people has persisted uh, throughout the framework in our, in our partner summit last week. We had Mayor Source Bergen you guys familiar with Eric's Amerisource Burger? They're like number 17 on the uh, Fortune 500 um, uh, from a revenue perspective. But their goal is actually to get the pharmaceutical, uh, the medicine, uh, as quickly as they possibly can to the patient. Avoid the middleman. Get it right into the patient's arm to help cure cancer. So they look at economics from a different way. How fast can we actually get the medicine to our client base? So it's not only about making the money, it's also about saving lives as well. That was all number one. I almost got past number one and I didn't do it without breaking up. So here we go. Number two, apply systems thinking. So when we're looking at the enterprise, how many systems are there in play? A lot. But when we roll it up, how many systems are there in play? One. One. So there's actually two. So there's the system in which we're building, which is building the value and, uh, to deliver to the customer. And then there's actually the organizational infrastructure 
which is a system in itself. And optimizing both of those systems is going to get us to the highest value. So when we look at our organization, we want to take that systems view. So we know we have complex systems. We know we have systems in which we have shared platforms that multiple of our product lines are sharing. We have uh, multiple uh, infrastructures and, and siloed people within our organization. Um, and, we, and we look at kind of how we want to optimize, and, and we want to optimize the system around um, um, all the interconnections as well. And we know that the system can only move as fast as its slowest interconnection. What are some examples that we see here at scale? I know you've got them. All of these pregnant pauses. Integration, CI, absolutely. How, how well are we able to bring all the different uh, components of the system together and prove out that the system is actually running? Good one. What else? This is a big one. We've already talked about it. Absolutely, DevOps. How soon can we actually get that, that releasable object out to the customer? I had one a client that I was working with, and when we would go to handoff to production, we would actually go to handoff to the NOC, there was 50 manual steps that the NOC had to take to get that uh, component out the door, or get that system out the door. And it would take anywhere from a week to three weeks to get it out the door. So it, was, it didn't take very long before uh, one of our Super smart engineer said, well, I'm going to automate this. Uh, and it took one uh, program increment, which is a, a quantum of time. It happened to be 10 weeks at that particular organization to automate everything to the point where uh, one button push in 20 minutes, the darn thing could get out the door. So we optimize the system. We, we remove the delays as well. But in order to, to remove those delays, we have to optimize and look at the entire value stream, all the steps that we need to take to get value out the door. And obviously at scale, this can be pretty big. So always looking at those delays. The Zoom variability preserve options. This is actually uh, a very fun one, especially when we're dealing with um, big things. Uh, one of the, one of the um, uh, clients we had in, in Boulder, Colorado was um, uh, uh, our National Missile, Missile Defense uh, Organization. And they were looking at uh, kind of doing set-based design and how they can preserve options. Because guess what? When they go and fire a test, they're actually sending a missile up into space. Right? So it's kind of hard to be able to be agile when you're sending a multi-million dollar vehicle into space. But when we're looking at development, <laughs> development actually occurs in an uncertain world. Most of the time, we're building things that nobody has ever built before. So when we're <laughs> writing down those requirements, how do we know that we're actually building the right thing? So we use a construct called, called set-based design where we want to have flexible specifications. We want to have flexible design sets. And we want to iterate on them. And the most important part of this is applying the knowledge that we get from this. So, so I, I'm sure every one of you has read Eric Reese's Lean Startup. Every single one, right? Raise your hand. Come on. <laughs> so being able to apply that knowledge uh, and, and, and learn along the way. And we know we, we can't possibly know everything from the start. It's, it's just impossible. I had uh, one, one organization where we were actually building something that nobody had ever done before. We were building an over-the-air update uh, uh, protocol for um, uh, uh, a, a wireless uh, called a wireless protocol called Zigbee. And we actually had to do this. It was actually critical to the success of the organization that we had this because we could not ship units into the consumers' homes without having this technology. They would be stranded, right? We would just basically put ourselves out of business. So I had the senior architect write up the requirements, and of course it was like a 50-page uh, document um, at the time and got into the release planning event where we had 100 people in the room and, and put this in front of the lead uh, firmware engineer 
And uh, you could see he just had this meltdown. I mean, he was just like, what? <laughs> Are you kidding me? I mean, I think you guys know the Ackerman, N Ackerman, Ackerman uh, NFW. I, I think he was kind of, kind of saying that. And, and uh, fortunately, we do release planning over a couple days. So he came in the next morning and he said, you know, I actually read this document. And I know I can't implement any of this uh, or all of it within the 10 week period that you're putting in front of me, but I can, I can send a signal from the server up through the internet, across the cloud, down through the backhaul, through the gateway, and, send, uh, and make the light on that in-home display blink. What do you think you said? Okay, <laughs> we'll take it and let's learn from that and let's iterate on that. So, and we'll iterate on that too, as well. So preservation of options includes those economic, uh, includes economic results, because we're gonna learn things along the way. And the most important thing about this learning is, yeah, we can go ahead and we can, we can iterate on something and maybe something doesn't work and, and we might fail on that, but let's look at the data. Let's analyze the data and let's share that and see if we can come up with uh, a new, a new uh, uh, theory around uh, what, what could work uh, going forward. So, build incrementally with fast integrated learning cycles. Now we all know this one. This is actually very near and dear to our heart. Uh, we, we talk about Agile and we talk about the ubiquity about it, but the reality is some of these organizations I go into, they're still doing this. <laughs> they're absolutely still thinking that they're getting value out of uh, the different different phases in a, in a waterfall environment of writing the requirements, uh, doing the design, you know, going into the implementation, and then and then finally the verification. But if you put this in front of any lean thinker, what do you think they're going to say? Would you rather have that? Or would you rather have this? I want the box. I want something that I can ship. I want something that I can iterate on to get feedback from my customer. So this one, I like to tell the story. So who's ever, who, who bought the first iPhone? The first. Yeah, the first iPhone. How much did you pay for it? Wow. Yeah, it was ridiculous. I think it was like $600. But we, we bought this thing because we're early adopters. Now what was the one thing that it couldn't do? Copy paste. What? Copy paste. Copy, copy paste. It actually, in the US, it actually couldn't even make a phone call. Right? <laughs> So the first iPhone comes out, it couldn't make a phone call, but what did we learn? It was actually pretty useful. It was, it was a computer in your pocket. What did Apple learn? We got billions of dollars in the bank from this first thing, and they got immediate feedback from their client base. Is that billion dollars still there? Probably. They got to monetize it. They got to monetize from it by just getting it out there. So get it out there, get it out in front of your customers and, and uh, get some revenue out of it going forward. And obviously, in, our, in order to do this, we have to integrate and test frequently. Right? That continuous integration has to be part of that as well. Uh, but sometimes doing your continuous integration from a system perspective can be extremely difficult. Uh, so make sure that, that we create these, uh, these pull events. Uh, that actually bring people together and have them talking and collaborating and making sure that they're working <laughs> together. How many of you have ever been in a, in a development shop where somebody checks in the code and it breaks everything else? And then, and then, the, de yeah, and then the developer says, well, you just broke my code. Well, what's the root cause of that? Instability. Instability. We didn't collaborate. We didn't even talk. Right? We didn't even have that ability to have that conversation. So it creates that, that routine communication. It reduces the, the variation. It creates an objective evaluation of the software. So when we're looking at value and the one objective metric that we should use to determine whether we're delivering value, what could that be at enterprise scale? One objective metric. Imagine if we got rid of all of our KPIs, all of our motivational factors around money. Customer satisfaction. Customer satisfaction could be one. Cycle time. Cycle time could be another. Net promoter score. What's that? Net promoter score. NPS, absolutely. So those are all great things that we should definitely be looking at from the portfolio perspective. 
But we can't even get those things until we have this one thing. Working software, right? We can't even get there until we have that system working. And that's the challenge, making sure that we always have that system working. And just know that development can only move as fast as that slowest integration loop. So taking a look at that and seeing how we can reduce those delays. That false feasibility uh, uh, plays false positive feasibility place uh, from waterfall to, for, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, iterative development, obviously. You know, it's kind of like we're working on hope. So we know the shorter that we reduce those iteration uh, cycles, the more knowledge we're going to get along the way. So it's preaching, preaching to the choir on that one. So base milestones and objective evaluation of working systems. And this is where I was just going from. You know, if we want to measure that one thing is how well is that system working? Is it actually coming together? Do we have a continuous integration system at the, at the program level? So dozens of teams working together, making sure that they're integrating all their assets, all their code uh, uh, at a timely uh, basis. So, so who's read Zantar uh, Osterwall's Lean Machine? Anybody? OK, that's homework for all of you. <laughs> Uh, you didn't know you were going to be in a class. Uh, so what some of the learnings that we, that we got from this book was two really smart product uh, managers got together and they started to look at this, this challenge of the phase gate approach. And they started to determine that there was actually no correlation between this you know, milestones and actually getting successful product out the door. Uh, so there's kind of this, uh, this idea that you know, it actually forces early uh, decisions too, too soon, and it creates that false positive feasibility. And it assumes that something actually exists when we don't even know enough about it to determine whether we can actually do that, uh, build it right the first time. And when we look at kind of the, the milestone approach, and we look at, you know, we always, uh, uh, from an agile perspective, what, a lean perspective, what kind of batch size uh, would, we, would we rather have? Large batch, small batch, small batch, absolutely. Uh, so from a from a milestone perspective, it creates it inherently creates these these large batches and long queues, and and uh, and the problem is, you know, you probably have milestones, you probably have dates in which you need to make, and there's uh, a lot of times no ways around that. But how how you start to eliminate them, and how you actually control the damages around them are the, the thinking that we'd like to put behind this as well. And Dr. Alan Ward, you know, phase gates are evil. Uh, read the book, it's got a good story around it. Um, uh, and Dr. Alan Ward, he's, he's no longer with us and, and you'll see why when you read the book. So, objective milestones. How do we know when we actually have something working? What constructs can we put into place to make sure that we always have something working. There's two. Test. Demos, yep. But how do we get to those demos? What are some of the guidelines we can put in place to get to those demos? Pardon me? Come up with a hypothesis and iterate early. Pivot, pivot early, right? What else? Two things that we can put in place to make sure. Testing, yeah. Cadence and synchronization. So making sure that the entire program uh, is, is aligned around the cadence and making sure that the entire program has the opportunity to synchronize uh, at, at common values. From, agile, from an agile physics perspective, the work will fit into those boundaries. So here we go. Visual, this, this one's not fair because we actually still have three uh, into number six. <laughs> so we'll dive into these as well. So another one from Ryerson. Obviously, we're looking for flow-based processes to deliver the information in, in a regular cadence of small batches, uh, which is exactly why we put that cadence and synchronization in place here. So how do we, how do we manage our WIP? How many of you are kind of those, those Kanban people out there? I know this is an agile conference, but know you're out there. Yeah, there we go. So what, 
what could we put in place here that could actually help this team? How do you think they're doing? From a big visual information radiator standpoint. Yeah. They've got quite a few things that they haven't started and haven't that are in development. Only a few things in test and one thing accepted. And they're, you know, how far away from are they from that sprint boundary? Okay. You think they're gonna make it? Doesn't look good. So what can we put in place? What would be the effect of a three-story whip limit on development test? What behavior do you think that would drive? Yeah, exactly. Focus, collaboration, and they'll swarm around it. They'll start to align around the work and getting that through the system. So what, what if there wasn't a, a wood constraint? What do you think the developer would do? You just pull more work in, right? Testers are going to test it, right? I don't, have, I don't have any control over that. But if we had perhaps a three-story whip limit uh, in development, uh, it would change the behavior. It would change the habits of the team. It might allow them to work together in a better way. So apply cadence and synchronize with the cross-domain planning. And I kind of got ahead of myself when I, was, when I was talking about this, so let's dive into it. So we want to control the variability with, with a cadence, a planning cadence. Uh, I, I like to tell this story because it's kind of making fun of myself. But when we got bought by Rational Software as Requisite Pro, we were a little shop, about 25 people. Uh, we had our own cadence and synchronization. and. Uh, we got bought by Rational and we were told that we uh, released on the quarterly boundary so we could actually make revenue and plan around what's coming. Uh, so I was the product manager for Requisite Pro and I was told that we were releasing on June 27th. I remember that date, June 27th, 1997. I remember that date because it was my wedding day <laughs> or my planned wedding day. So we got to about four weeks out from releasing this product, and I knew it was in trouble. I knew uh, that we had a high level of defects. Uh, the system wasn't coming together. Um, uh, developers were nervous. We didn't have enough testing in place. We overloaded the system. You know, all the things we did, we should have done right that we did wrong. Uh, so then it became about two weeks out. What do you think I did? <laughs> How do you think that went? Not so well. Didn't go over very well. You'll never marry me. So uh, the importance of cadence and synchronization is, is making it visible as well. Applying the cadence, uh, putting out the dates in which we're always going to synchronize, we're always going to come together and do cross-domain planning so we can plan our lives around it. So this has other emotional factors around it. We can actually plan our lives. We can plan our vacations. We can plan our weddings. We can plan our babies. We can plan our surgeries around this cadence and synchronization. It actually makes our lives better. We can be a little more predictable around our work infrastructure. Not to mention the fact that we, we have the chance to, you know, how long does it take to fail if you have a two week iteration? Two weeks, right? So what's the Twitter uh, definition of fail? There's only the one. You can tweet this if you want, because it's already been tweeted. First attempt at integrating learning. Okay, go ahead. I'll tweet that one. All right. So we want to be able to <laughs> distribute planning and control those, and control to those who understand and can react to the end results. We want to be able to decentralize control to the people who actually know the most about the work. And we do this by, by synchronizing with cross-domain planning. So this is actually where we get to set the aim of the organization. We get to set the aim of the system. <coughs> without, without aim, there actually is no system. So, so let's, let's set that aim, let's communicate the aim, and let's do this face-to-face. -face. But we know in reality that sometimes this is really hard. I've been working with one large organization, and uh, it's been taking about nine months. Uh, we went in. 
we, we taught the leaders, uh, we organized around value, we did value stream workshops, uh, uh, we had to put in a Kanban system at the, at the program level because we had multiple value streams coming together and, and we needed to have a way of, of managing uh, that throughput as well. Uh, and it's taken about uh, nine months, but there's no way that we can physically pull together San Jose, Bangalore, and Chennai to be able to, to plan together. But we can do this through our remote tools. We can do this through our technology. Uh, so this is exactly what we do. So, so management sets the mission. They set the aim of the organization. They communicate uh, what, the, what the vision is, you know, what, what our SWOT analysis is, you know, what, are, what are our strengths, what are our, our weaknesses, what are, what are our threats. Um, and, then, and then we align the organization around architectural guidance and development best practices so that we can all be march marching towards the same thing. And then we let the teams plan. Amazing things happen when you get 100 people in the room. They actually start talking to each other. They communicate. They start solving problems together. Uh, I, I like to say, I, I teach a lot, by the way. I, go into these companies that I teach, and my, my least favorite thing to do is teach a class of 10 people. Because there's just not enough collaboration, right? We just don't have enough people in there to actually solve some of the problems. My most favorite thing to do after that first time that I did it is actually go in there and have dozens of people uh, communicating and collaborating, because it makes my job so much easier. They start doing the work. They start seeing the problems, and they start solving the work. So the teams actually create, and they, through a pool-based system, they, they take responsibility for the plans. And what better way of getting a more predictable solution than letting the teams take responsibility for the plans themselves, having that pool-based system. So this is, a, I'm going to show a little video. I don't know that I have audio around this. This was another one that I did a couple of years ago. Um, and one of the first classes that I was in, uh, there was a gentleman in the room, and he was from Denmark. And he said, "Oh, Jennifer, um, I'd love to have you come do this this uh, this this launch. You know, this big program launch. We're planning. We're actually we're building a hospital, and uh, we're building all the infrastructure and architecture and communications around this hospital, and and um, and it's going to be uh, around uh, 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 a lot of different um, uh, geographical locations." And I said, "Cool." So he didn't call me back for about two years. <laughs> And finally coming back, he said, well, we finally organized around value. We finally know who these people are. We finally know where they are. You know, can, can you come do this? And I said, absolutely. So when we dove into it, we, we determined that there were five different locations. There was Malmo, Sweden, uh, London, Bangalore, um, Rockford, Connecticut, and, um, and Massachusetts. Uh, so we planned for about 12 weeks to, to make this thing come together. And believe me, this is not without planning. This doesn't happen, like, this is, going back to the wedding metaphor, this is almost like planning a wedding, right? This is, this is you know, you have, to, you have to invite the people, you have to make sure they're coming, you have to have the location, you have to have the logistics, you have to have food, right? You have to have all the tools, you've got to have the sticky notes and the wall space and the audio visual and all the things that, that happen around that. So, uh, some amazing things actually happened uh, at the outcome of this. So I went over to Malmo and uh, that was where most of the people were, some of these smaller uh, uh, locations had a few dozen people, uh, enough that they needed on-site coaching to, to help them. So it actually took about seven days to, to get the leadership on board, to, to train the teams on a common language, to train them on Scrum, uh, to have them align around uh, the cadence and synchronization that we had. And then uh, after this video, I'll kind of tell you the learnings from this. So, first thing we did again, trained up everybody, and then we physically had to move off site. Pardon me? Oh, it went away, didn't it? Thank you. Didn't test this before I. There we go. So, trained up the leaders got them aligned around what they needed to do and how they could economically sequence their backlog. Then, then again, we didn't have enough room uh, within headquarters in, in Sweden, so we physically moved to a dance hall. <laughs> and over the weekend we planned, we put the program board together, 
Uh, then we got everybody in a room, and while the leaders were had already had the knowledge, they started to apply it with the teams as well and become that, that internal coalition for change. So you can see the teams are starting to have some fun. They're starting to create some uh, bah, kind of the we, the work, the knowledge are one. They're learning how to do estimation at scale. We're doing some, some simulations to, uh, you know, to show them how to run a real scrum and how to run a real scrum of scrums. And, and then we actually had the architects in the back helping us pull the program board together so we can actually see the dependencies. Uh, that was actually the lead architect uh, and then the systems architect and then our, our continuous integration uh, platform and then our product manager having the features up there and asking the teams to come pull your feature. Come get the work that you're going to be working on. So working out the dependencies, walking the walls, having the, the, uh, the business owners walk the walls and, and answer any questions, uh, perhaps adjust some of the, some of the some of the acceptance criteria. We have people dedicated to audio visual. Uh, you can see the program board coming together and the dependencies across the teams. And while we always want to organize our Scrum teams with that end-to-end -end, uh, functionality, obviously at scale we're going to have some dependencies across those teams. So how do, how do we manage that? So aligning the teams and the program around objectives. So not getting down into the details around what stories you're going to be delivering, but no, what are the program objectives? What value are we actually going to be delivering at the end of this as well? So bringing them up to the front of the room as they're accepted by the program. And then across the pond, we had other teams that were working in parallel. And we were synchronizing over time zones. And uh, at the time, we actually had a couple hour time boxes in which the teams could, could talk and communicate over these five time zones. So at the end, you know, getting, getting the commit, how confident are they in actually delivering the value in which uh, they committed to. They managed their whip. They were the ones that actually filled their backlogs uh, with the ask from, from the program itself. So some of, the, some of the really interesting things from a cultural perspective that came into so who's ever uh, done any work in Sweden? Anybody? Yeah. So uh, how are those sweets, right? Are they? Can you like? Can you like be best buddies on the first day? Yeah. No. They're a little stoic, right? It takes a little while to, to get into into their lives and understand what makes them tick. So so I think you see uh, throughout that video they were starting to have some fun. They were starting to laugh and smile and collaborate and communicate. And that one system architect, the, the blonde guy uh, with the black hat, um, he um, came up to me on that final Friday. So we had done planning over Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Thursday night we all went out drinking because it was May in Sweden and you know you stay up till like 2 o'clock in the morning. So we kind of roamed in about 10 o'clock the next morning uh, into the kitchen and they were having their pastries and everything and Peter came up to me and he was quite emotional. Uh, uh, Throughout the, the three days, you could really see the conflict that was happening from an architectural standpoint, uh, where uh, Massachusetts really felt like Sweden had a lock hold on the architecture. They weren't sharing, they weren't collaborating, they weren't communicating in a really effective way. And Peter came up to me and he said, thank you for breaking down 156 years of cultural barriers. I finally feel like I can work with my team. So bringing, just allowing the opportunity for people to work together. They didn't reorganize the organization at all. All they did was allowed a few hundred people to work together to collaborate and create solutions to actually build and execute and deliver this hospital, this big thing, at the end of, at the, end of uh, the plan. So, the mouse back. And finally, unlock the intrinsic motivation of knowledge workers. So we know that our people are the ones that are, that, that are doing the work. They are actually smarter than us. I hope that as, as leaders and coaches of your organizations, you always go after that person that is smarter than you. So workers themselves are best placed to make decisions on how to perform their work. We provide the what? We provide the vision, the ask and let them actually determine how they're going to do the work. And to be effectively led, workers must be heard and respected. 
I like to play a little, uh, have a little uh, hypothesis here. So, how many of you are engineers? Bring up, okay, hold up your hand. Keep your hand up if you were a problem child. <laughs> there we go, there's a few. I don't know if that proves out my hypothesis or it just embarrasses me, but, but I was that problem child too. Uh, and I actually uh, followed the engineering path and, and I determined, it's taken me a very long time, but I determined that it's not because I was a problem child. It was because I wanted to figure it out myself. And when you're two, that's really hard for your parents to understand. But we know that as engineers. We like to solve problems. It's innate. It's in our body. So we also like to manage ourselves. We like to have autonomy. Let me figure it out. Let me work with my smart people. Let me figure this out. So innovation has to be part of the work. It has to be part of the goal of the organization. It has to be embedded. It has to be embedded in the DNA of the, of the organization. So uh, I have one son, and he's 24. And uh, he, he didn't know what he wanted to be at, after high school. And, and I took him down the road to uh, Colorado School of Mines because I knew he was a science and math major. And I said, let me just check this out. So he was sold. And he was like, oh, I'm totally going to do this. I'm going to be an engineer. And uh, I'll never forget this moment, actually, after he sat with the administrar and he got all signed up. We went out to lunch afterwards, and I was all proud. You know, he's going to be an engineer. And he said to me, Mom, what's an engineer? <laughs> so he didn't know, but he knew he liked to solve problems. And uh, to this day, he's solving problems. He, uh, he, he started with a little startup doing uh, artificial intelligence, and he was actually building, you know, having a lot of fun, innovating the entire way, you know, learning a little bit about Agile and, and innovating a little, little small shop, about 20 people in Denver, Colorado. And uh, lo and behold, uh, about six months ago, he got bought by the Watson team, uh, by the IBM Watson team. So now he's still innovating. He's having a lot of fun. He went through that, that transition phase where you have to, you know, you get adopted by IBM and you get to all IBM practices and he was getting a little worried about that. But they've, they've taken a hands-off approach and he's constantly learning. They're constantly innovating and they're constantly allowing the teams uh, to have innovation be part of that process. And I'll never forget, he, he brought me in to give me a tour. They're building a, a kind of a Watson headquarters down in Denver. And he, and he brings me in the front door. And this is, this is, this is, you know, I'm so proud of my dork son because I'm a dork. He brings me in the door and he says, Mom, stand right there. And there's a robot, like a Terminator robot there. And his eyes light up and, and he hits his watch. And I'm standing there. About three seconds later, the robot says, Hello, Jennifer Fawcett. And he's like, three second regression test. That's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> recognition and he actually trolled, trolled their databases and, 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 and came back with my picture and, and recognized me so that was kind of cool. So continuing, continuing innovation has to be part of the work. It has to be embedded, embedded within the organization. And just validating the fact that um, maybe it's a little more intrinsic. Maybe you don't need to put the carrot in front of them. Maybe you don't need to continuously you know, give them enough money. You have to give them enough money to take money off the table as Dan Pink would say. But perhaps the work itself might have its own intrinsic reward and help with attrition and making sure that we're constantly keeping our knowledge workers happy with the work that they're doing and the value that they're creating. And then the last one, decentralizing decision making. Tough one at scale, right? So certain things absolutely need to be centralized. What would be some examples of things that we would want to centralize? Decisions that we'd want to centralize at enterprise scale. Vision strategy. Vision strategy, absolutely. Say we're making an economic decision around moving databases. Would we want our teams to make that decision? Probably not. We want to have some economics. We want to have uh, some leadership around that so that they can fund it. Make sure we're doing uh, enough research and, and analysis around the right database for sure. Same thing with perhaps our single sign-on protocols, right? Would we want our teams to be able to build their own, you know, single sign-on for each individual team? No. Why do we want to have a little bit of architectural governance and guidance around that so we can all align around that? But some of the things 
are better suited for the knowledge workers themselves to actually make the decisions. What would be some examples around that? Hiring. Pardon me? Hiring. Hiring? Yeah, you would want your team members to interview the people that they're going to be working with. What else? Perhaps how they implement a story? Perhaps some of the methods that they're using? Technology. The technology, perhaps? You might want to allow them to experiment so we can learn around that as well. So create, create an economic logic behind the decision and create a mechanism in which you can actually empower the individuals to make a decision. So one of the companies we went into, uh, they were running three agile release trains. And uh, in the inspect and adapt, which is the activity we do at the end of the program increment to make sure that the program uh, is actually applying the learnings. Uh, what we determined was actually we went through a root cause analysis. We did our whole Ishikawa thing and five whys. And what we determined was the teams actually didn't trust that the program was going to accept anything less than 120% uh, for the value that they were delivering at the end. Do you think that was effective? Absolutely not. So we're having that mistrust between uh, the, the, the program and the team. So we determined we needed to fig figure out a way in which we could empower the teams to make those economic decisions by themselves and create a framework in which they knew when they should ask uh, and perhaps create a delay in the system because every time you have to ask, you kind of have to wait, or whether we should just empower them to go. So I invite you to take take a, uh, this, this, this little framework uh, at home and, and consider some of the decisions that you're making within your organization and, and a pro framework around it. Uh, see whether some of these things you should deep, uh, decentralize or whether they, they should be centralized. So some of the things you might use are, you know, how frequent is it? If it's frequent, you'd make it a two. If it's a time critical, you'd make it a two. And then you kind of, does it have economies of scale? We kind of had to reverse the math to make, make the framework work. So, so I invite you to, to take that home and, and then figure out how you could better decentralize control and allow your knowledge workers uh, to make the decisions um, where, where they have the most knowledge. So principles are great, but clarity, uh, clarity on how to think without clarity on how to act leaves people unmotivated. So not only do we have these principles that we can think about, but we're going to want to act around them as well and to show our organization that we're thinking too and that we've taken this knowledge and we're actually applying it and learning with you. So that's Scale Agile Framework 3.0. Uh, I'll pause for a moment. I don't know how long I've been talking or what my time box is. i got to wrap it up. So with that, uh, Framework 4 is coming out. Uh, it's imminent, uh, but it's going to come out uh, when we're ready shortly. So if you have any questions on that, I'm here. My name is Jennifer Fawcett, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions.